Stanford University. Hello, in this video I'm going to continue the series talking about customer development and lean startups. So in the last video I spoke a bit about why this is so difficult. That part of it is the psychology of the entrepreneur. And so we spoke about how entrepreneurship is a balancing act where you have to balance between being too optimistic versus too pessimistic. You have to balance between being flexible and being persistent. In today's video, I want to talk about three things. The first is some critiques of the lean startup or customer development model. The second is the debate uh, about lean versus fat startups. And the third is a little bit about some metrics that you want to keep track of in a startup venture. So let's start out with some critiques. I've been talking about the model of customer development and lean startups. What are some possible criticisms or some alternative views? In some ways, the idea that you have to listen to and respond to feedback from customers is almost obvious advice. But we also have this famous quote that's attributed to Henry Ford, where he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So apparently Henry Ford never actually said this, but nonetheless, there is this idea that customers don't necessarily know or can't necessarily think of these breakthrough next generation innovations. And so the other argument that's given is the argument from Apple and Steve Jobs, that Steve Jobs was this brilliant visionary who would never assemble a group of customers for a customer feedback session or elicit ideas from them. The argument is that, again, radical new products. In the early days, it was forecast that we might need perhaps 10 computers. And so when you have something as radically new as the first desktop computer, it can be difficult for people to imagine how they might use it and, and thus to give these kinds of ideas to customers. There's this idea that perhaps uh, rather than listening too closely to customers that it might be good to actually have a vision, to actually not necessarily listen to customers but trust your gut instinct. And there might be some truth to this. Certainly I would tell you that if you have an idea that you believe in strongly and there's some reason why you've listened to custo potential customer feedback and believe that the customer is wrong, that the idea has merit, then you should consider pursuing this and still moving forward. But only once you've really considered why it is that you're not getting the type of positive feedback from customers that you think you should and, and why this feedback is wrong. Um, not many people are Steve Jobs, and so if you're going to just trust your gut instinct, you have to be really sure about it. We also have several notions mixed up together. Uh, one is this idea of rapid iteration, that you have to respond to feedback from the market and rapidly iterate. Another idea here, which I'll talk more about in a minute, is the lean startup idea, that you have to raise the minimal amount of funding and that you shouldn't spend too much cash, you should be very conservative about what you spend money on and how much money you raise. And this has its own merits, but also some downsides I'll talk about in a second. The next notion is this idea of hypothesis testing, that in a startup you're designing experiments. And this can be criticized for the lack of um, kind of a bold conviction. Sometimes in a startup, rather than spending all this time going through experiments and testing your hypotheses, you just have to move forward and you have to quickly design the product and you can't spend too much time worrying about do I have the right product market fit, is my revenue model the right one, sometimes you have to act boldly. And Similarly on rapid iteration, releasing a product too early, releasing a beta version can potentially harm your reputation. And so there's a reason why we tend to hold back until the product is more perfected to get feedback. So these are arguments that you'll hear <clears throat> on the other side, and justifiably so. Truth in all of these arguments, and these are things that need to be balanced carefully with the customer development or lean startup model. 
Next is uh, this notion of, the, of what it means to be lean and doing a lean startup versus a fat startup. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each. Some of the advantages of being lean, which basically means raising only the minimum amount of capital that you need, trying to bootstrap and get by on just the bare minimum investment. Obviously, this offers a greater return on investment. If you don't have to raise as much money, if you don't have to invest enough, then you'll wind up getting a greater return if successful. You also lose less equity to investors. Each time you raise money, you have to give up a portion of the company. And this also, and perhaps this is the most compelling reason, allows you to retain more control and more flexibility to change direction. Once you've raised money from venture capital investors, particularly if it's a large amount of money, it can become more difficult to change direction if you need to. And so you, you, you lose some of the flexibility that startups might need when they're still in the process of finding their business model. On the other hand, we shouldn't discount the advantages of being fat, of raising sufficient capital. Some types of opportunities may require more money. Um, it may require spending more money to get top engineers and top talent. You certainly don't want to save money by going with second-rate talent in your startup. It also provides you some cushion if there's a downturn. If you've been raising the minimum possible amount of money and there's a recession, then it can become much more difficult to raise additional funding. And so if you allow yourself to raise more money than you actually need, this gives you some cushion in case there's a recession, in case there's a large competitor who moves into your space who you suddenly have to start competing with and expending more cash. And so I want to show you one short video clip that's talking about this debate. So this is Mark Schuster, and he's talking a little bit about this debate about lean versus fat startups. Mark Schuster says that um, a lean startup shouldn't raise that much money, and then eventually, if it hits product market fit, it should become fat. I said that. It's true. Eric Ries, one of the most beloved young speakers, lecturers uh, in Silicon Valley, someone who's reading I, write, I, I read and enjoy, wrote a response which I found curious. He said, Mark misunderstood the meaning of the term lean startup. Luckily, there's an internet, so I pulled up the definition of lean. <laughs> Without much flesh or fat, not plump, of edible meat containing little or no fat, lacking in richness, full, spare, economical. And yet he says the lean startup is about moving fast. The fast startup is about moving fast. The rapid startup is about moving fast. The quick startup. Not the lean startup. And OK, it's not my movement. I'll let you have your movement. But I believe in lean startup. And then something changes. You raised a little bit of money. You work on your product. You don't do what I did, which is spend too much money, hire a bunch of developers before you figured it all out. Um, what I often tell people is you should be flipping hamburgers if you're going to run a hamburger chain. And that means that you're doing customer support, you're answering phone calls, you're going on sales calls, you're involved in product management, you do user testing. Raising too much capital too quickly before there's a product market fit makes this very hard to do. <coughs> so I sort of agree with what Ben Horowitz said, which is the fat startup. And it's OK later in life, obviously I would think this, um, to, to get a bit fat. And what I mean is, if you become Foursquare, you got two choices. You can sell, and that $100 million outcome for most people that Yahoo reportedly had offered would have been quite nice. But the founders had already had one exit, and I think they really wanted to change the world, and I think that's great. But if you're going to change the world, and you wake up the sleeping lions of Silicon Valley to this opportunity, you better get fat pretty quickly. 
because you've got Yelp in town here, and those guys are smart and move fast, and you obviously have Facebook in town here, and those guys are very smart and move very fast. So if you're going to compete with people in what people call winner-take-most markets, you need to be fat. So we see Groupon and Living Social who have raised money and are big and are growing. I don't think number five, six, seven, eight are going to be that relevant in the long run. So there are times where fat is okay. And so you heard Mark Schuster, a venture capitalist here in Silicon Valley, talking about how you should stay lean until you've reached what he called product market fit. And then you should become fat and raise more capital to start scaling up we want to start talking about. So how would you know when you've reached product market fit, the point at which you've developed a product that fits the market and you're ready to start scaling up the venture? You need to start paying attention to certain startup metrics. And so what are these metrics for startups? In a large company, the relevant metrics that you might look at are things like the cash flow statement, income, profit and loss statement, but as you can imagine, for a startup, most of these things are going to be zero. You have very little revenue. You're making losses. How do you tell if you're actually making progress, if the time has come to raise additional capital and begin building out the organization? There's a different set of metrics for a startup. And you'll have to think through your own venture and the industry that you're in to know exactly which set is right for you. But these things might be things that are characteristics of your user base. Things like the number of registrations or the number of activations. What percentage of people who land on your website are actually signing up or downloading the software? How many of these customers do you retain for at least 30 days or for at least 90 days? How many of them switch over to become paying customers? Or you might look at other types of financials. Revenue certainly is a relevant one. The margins that you're making, uh, which is your um, profit margin, the amount of revenue minus the costs for each sale. Your ca the level of cash that you have is certainly key in a startup. You can't survive in, if you're running out of cash. Your burn rate, how much cash are you burning per month? Or they might be customer acquisition metrics, things like what does it cost you to acquire a new customer? What are your advertising expenses? What's your viral acquisition ratio? So for each customer that you get, how many other customers do they refer to the site who wind up coming and signing up? You can also do things like web metrics, the total number of unique visitors or page views. Um, what's the present value or the net present value of, of acquiring a customer? What's the lifetime value of having that customer and retaining them? These are the types of metrics that are more important for a startup venture and that we'll talk more about as we go forward in the course. Finally, I want to play one more video clip for you, which comes from a debate between two VCs about lean versus fat startup model. If it helps you being lean to achieve that goal, then that's great. But if not, if it's better to uh, deploy a lot of capital to achieve that goal, then by all means embrace your fatness. Uh, getting into the specifics, let me restate uh, Fred's definition of lean startup, which is basically don't raise a boatload of cash until you've both achieved product market fit and uh, you are getting real traction in the market. And by real traction, what Fred meant was people are buying or using your product in droves. And as I said, this is a good tactic, but unfortunately, uh, it's been elevated by many people in the venture capital community and the entrepreneurial community from a tactic to a complete and comprehensive operational theory. And as an operational theory, it has quite a few holes. Let me point out three. First, it presumes that you actually know when you've achieved product market fit. And this is often quite unobvious. Uh, for example, Apple's iPod did not sell a million units until after three years, uh, until two years after it was launched. Compare this with the iPhone, which sold a million units in its first three days. So at what point did the, iPad, did the iPod have product market fit? Um, and at what point should have Apple invested in the Mini and the Nano? 
by lean startup theory, maybe not for a while, but that would have been incorrect. Now, lean startup theory does explain what to do with the iPhone once they sold a million units in three days, but that's also not very interesting. Uh, the second problem with it is the lean startup theory presumes that once you have product market fit, you can't lose it. Um, and this is also not the case. Um, for example, at uh, one of the previous startups that I was at, Netscape, we had product market fit on the browser, um, but lost it when Microsoft eliminated the market for browsers. And we were $250 million in revenue per year at that time. They eliminated the market by basically saying it was part of the OS and removing all the money from the market. So at that point, we had to regain product market fit, and we didn't have the luxury of taking the time to do it in the lean startup way. And in fact, we built the, silver, the server product line from zero to $600 million in two years by applying uh, what might be referred to as a FAT methodology. And then the third problem is the lean startup theory implies that there are, or presumes there's no competition. And so what happens if prior to achieving product market fit, prior to building the product that everybody wants and are buying it in droves, even though you believe you have a theory that's going to work, you believe the market is very large, a very scary competitor emerges. VMware had this issue, uh, and their answer was to double headcount every single year to make sure that they took the market ahead of open source competitors like Zen and big scary competitors like Microsoft, and that worked well. Um, so basically, as an operational theory, the lean startup method doesn't work very well. So why do I even care about this at all, and why did I write the post? Well, for two reasons. One, entrepreneurs are confused, and a lot of them are harming their companies by avoiding things that cost money when they should spend money on them, like building a sales force, uh, for example. Um, but more importantly, we see entrepreneurs avoiding big ideas. And every day, somebody comes into our office every week, and somebody from Harvard or MIT or Stanford, a brilliant computer scientist, and pitches us on a very small idea. They want to do ad targeting optimization. And this is tragic. Sorry, that was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> but it is tragic. Some of you are probably building ad targeting optimization companies right now. But if you look at, if the inventors of yesteryear took being lean as seriously as entrepreneurs do today, instead of airplanes and telephones and automobiles, we would have pantyhose that fit exactly right and were targeted at our own figures. Um, so in conclusion, building a company is really hard, so you might as well build something important. And when you're going to build something important, keep focused on that goal. And if being lean is the right way to reach the goal, great. But if it requires being fat, remember that big is beautiful. OK. Fred. So I want to address this question from both the entrepreneur's perspective and also the investor's perspective. I think from the entrepreneur's perspective, what you want to, the equation you want to solve for is the expected value of exit for you personally as the entrepreneur. And I think that equation looks like something like um, the probability of a meaningful exit times the amount of ownership you'll have at exit times the value of the expected exit. So let's just leave the value of the expected exit uh, the same for this argument and focus on the two variables that really matter here, which is the probability of a successful exit and the ownership that uh, you will have at exit. And I, I don't think that you can double the probability of an expected exit by uh, doubling the amount of cash that you raise. And the reason is that the probability of a successful exit is going to be a function of many things. The most common are the quality of the idea, the quality of the product, the quality of the team, the amount of capital resources you have, the market and how it develops, and luck. And while cash is one of those variables, it's not the only variable. And so if you double the amount of cash you have, you don't necessarily double the probability of success. On the other hand, if you double the amount of cash that you raise at any point along the way at a set valuation, you double the amount of dilution. So if you just look at that formula, you optimize for probability of success. And, and in doing so, increase the amount of dilution you take you probably are going to reduce the expected value of your personal exit. You may increase the success of the company, 
uh, and you may, may increase the overall value to society, which Ben points to, and I think those are very good points, but for you as an entrepreneur, this I think is a bad idea. Now let's talk about it from the investor's perspective. Investors are really solving for two uh, things. They're solving for the highest return on investment, and that's dollars out divided by dollars in, and they're solving for mitigating as much of the risk in the investment as they possibly can. And the way that you do that as an investor is you put very small amount of capital in when the risk is very high, and as the opportunity develops over time, you increase the amount of capital that you have at risk as the risk gets mitigated in the opportunities that are scaling into their markets the way you want. That's the classic early stage venture capital model. You start with a quarter or half a million dollar seed, then you follow with a million to uh, first quote, quote unquote venture round, then maybe three to five million, and then as the opportunity scales, five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars. And that allows you to have uh, a lot of capital in and a lot of capital out, but also m minimizing the amount of risk along the way. So for both the entrepreneur's perspective and the investor's perspective, staying lean in the beginning and keeping the amount of dollars at risk and the amount of dilution as small as possible along the way until the valuation reaches a point where you can raise a lot of money and minimize your dilution is the absolute best way to maximize the expected value, the exit for the entrepreneur, and is also the way to maximize the uh, return on investment and risk mitigation for the investor. And that's why the venture capital model has been worked so well over the past 30 or 40 years is because the alignment, when done correctly, between the entrepreneur and the investor is very, very high. And that allows the entrepreneur and the investors, the early stage investors, to act as true partners in building that business. So, uh, so while I agree with Ben that there are times when you need to get fat, I think early on it's a very bad idea and the lean model works very well in the first two, three, maybe even four years of a company's existence um, and, and you want to stay lean for as long as you possibly can. You saw there some of the debate be uh, between the lean versus fat startup models. And we'll talk more about financing and fundraising in future videos, but I wanted to at least introduce some of these ideas and some of the debate around them. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.